The gaming industry is often very unpredictable, but it's become anything but after a massive leak of information from NVIDIA has spilled the beans on just about every game coming for the next couple years. Good morning, good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for April 12th, 2022. If you prefer to consume the show the way it's intended, in a podcast feed so you can listen on your phone as you get ready for work or your commute, head to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. It's free on our YouTube channel for everyone else. You can find our flagship show, Game Face, by searching your favorite podcast service. Please give the show a review if you can. It can make a huge difference for us. So I hinted at this yesterday in Good Morning Gaming when I mentioned that Kingdom Hearts 4's big announcement wasn't all that big because it was a part of the massive NVIDIA leak that occurred last September. At first, we thought most of it to be absurd, because it almost seemed too random to be true, but as time has gone on, even its craziest contents have proven to be true. Kotaku published an excellent article on this today, and I encourage you to read it, you should find it in your SIFs. But my comments in GMG yesterday were a preface to what I wanted to discuss today, and it looks like Kotaku and I are on the same wavelength. The problem is that the list of games and products is almost 6,000 strong. Now, some of them are for applications and programs, but most of them are actual games. At the time, a rework of Chrono Cross seemed ridiculous, but the game launched this week, and we'll be talking about it today on Game Face. The list of correct projects runs on and on. PlayStation exclusives coming to PC like God of War was included in the leak, and it's long since been released. The Tactics Ogre remaster was also in the leak, which seemed completely random at the time, and then this weekend, Square Enix registers a trademark for Tactics Ogre Reborn. Crisis 4, Street Fighter 6, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order 2, and the GTA Remastered trilogy were also included. At this point, it's pretty safe to assume the list is legit, and we can start looking ahead at games that are included, but haven't yet been announced. Here's the next several E3 spoiled for you, courtesy of the NVIDIA leak, a list of tasty PC games that have yet to be announced, but likely will be unless they've been canceled. Here we go. Contraband, Gears of War 6, Gravity, Halo 5 Guardians, Indus, an untitled game from the initiative, Kalimba, Oxide, The Demon Souls remake, Deracine, Gran Turismo 7, Helldivers 2, Horizon Forbidden West, Returnal, Sackboy A Big Adventure, Final Fantasy 7 Remake, Final Fantasy 9 Remake, Final Fantasy 16, Final Fantasy Tactics Remastered, Dragon's Dogma 2, Monster Hunter 6, Resident Evil 4 Remake, Street Fighter 6, which has now been officially announced, Bioshock 2022, we'll see if that makes it this year, a Bioshock Remaster, seems a little early for that, a Mirror's Edge Remaster, seems really early for that, the game didn't do great in the first place, Titanfall 3, as Dusk Falls and as Dusk Falls Season 2, a Batman Arkham Knight remaster, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 remastered, City Skylines 2, no brainer, Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled, again for PC, Crisis 4, that's now been announced, Death Stranding Director's Cut, that's already been announced, Destroy All Humans 3, Earth Defense Force 6, Fight for Middle Earth, Goat Simulator 2, Half Life 2 remastered, Hitman Pro, Human Fall Flat 2, Injustice 3, Gods Will Fall, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, a Switch exclusive, and another Switch exclusive, Mario Plus Rabbids, Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, and 3 Snake Eater HD, Metro Next, which would be, I'm assuming, the next Metro shooter, Mortal Kombat Next Gen, and 12, Moss, the PlayStation VR exclusive, coming to PC, Outcast, Payday 3, Space Punks, Stalker Android, The Talos Principle 2, Titan Quest 2, Tekken 8, Total War 9, Sniper Elite 5, Ultra Street Fighter 2, The Final Challengers, which is a Switch exclusive, looks like it's coming to PC, Viking by Criterion, Worms Next, a sequel to Wreckfest, and XCOM 3. Again, just spoiled the next several E3s for you with a list of games that at this point I fully believe are legit. I was reluctant to give the NVIDIA leak much credit, but over the last six months, 
it's just become too apparent that it's right on the money. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your SIFs. Sony and Lego Group have announced today that they are investing $1 billion each in Fortnite maker Epic Games. This latest investment follows on from the $200 million Sony put towards Epic last April. That we all kind of wondered, why would Sony do that? Here's a quote from Sony. As a creative entertainment company, we are thrilled to invest in Epic to deepen our relationship in the metaverse field, a space where creators and users share their time. We are also confident that Epic's expertise, including their powerful game engine, combined with Sony's technologies, will accelerate our various efforts, such as the development of new digital fan experiences in sports and our virtual production initiatives. That came from Kenichiro Yoshida. He's the chairman and president and CEO of Sony Group Corporation. Soren Thorup Sorensen from Lego states, Epic Games is known for building playful and creative experiences and empowering creators large and small. This investment will accelerate our engagement in the world of digital play, and we are pleased to be investing in Epic Games to support their continued growth journey with a long-term focus toward the future metaverse. And if you remember, this is just a culmination of the deal that was announced last week between Lego and Epic Games. So what we have here are both Sony and Lego placing their bets on the metaverse on Epic Games. If Epic can continue to collect partners like this for the metaverse, particularly ones that are willing to pay Epic a billion dollars a piece for the metaverse, it may be game over. Gearbox owner Embracer says it plans to continue its 8 billion acquisition spree. It's made 62 acquisitions since just 2020 for a total of 8.1 billion. And the CEO says it wants to make a similar number of acquisitions in the coming months and years. Apparently there is just an endless, bottomless bucket of cash at Embracer. The publisher claims it wants to invest in the free-to-play game space, as well as in countries like the UK, the US, Poland, France, and China. Embracer has a market valuation of $9.9 billion, 115 internal game development studios, that's crazy, and 10 operating groups, including THQ Nordic, Coke Media, Deep Silver, Saber Interactive, and Gearbox. Oddly enough, its biggest acquisition so far has been a board game manufacturer for almost $3 billion. It also purchased U.S. comic book publisher Dark Horse Media last year. It's a rising force in the industry, to be sure. We've talked about Battlefield 2042 a couple times on Good Morning Gaming, and once again, it's made the news today. Battlefield 2042's Steam concurrent player number fell below 1,000 for the first time today. The peak was 2,400 players over the last 24 hours, while Battlefield 5's peak was around 20,000 for the same time period. Now, those numbers obviously don't count console or origin players, but it's not looking good at all. Less than 1,000 players. Maybe this news shouldn't come as a surprise since Battlefield 2042 is one of the lowest reviewed games in the history of Steam. There's currently a petition for refunds on all platforms that has over 230,000 signatures. It might be time for EA to cut its losses. According to the UK box charts, Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga is the UK's biggest Lego launch ever. Ever! It's also the second biggest box release of the year so far, just behind Pokemon Legends Arceus. The Lego franchise is huge in the UK. I don't know why, but it is. It's the fifth biggest games brand by box sales, and it's ahead of other properties like Assassin's Creed, Need for Speed, Sonic the Hedgehog, and even Star Wars itself. Elsewhere, Kirby and the Forgotten Land dropped a second, but it's still tracking to be the best-selling Kirby game of all time in the territory. And then Elden Ring fell to number six, while Tiny Tina's Wonderland exited the top 10 altogether. As mentioned earlier, Kingdom Hearts 4 was announced over the weekend, and now today we have a follow-up with more information. According to Japanese publication Famitsu, quote, the full game will be made with Unreal Engine 5, and the quality of lighting and detail will be several levels higher than what we saw in the debut trailer. It was also shared that Kingdom Hearts 4 is being developed by Square Enix's Osaka Studio, the same team behind Kingdom Hearts 3, led by co-director Yasushi Yasui. Kingdom Hearts 4 is set to take place in an alternate world called Quadratum. Square Enix describes it as a large, expansive city set in a gorgeous, realistic world 
unlike anything ever seen before in the Kingdom Hearts series. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's boss fight, where I tackle random topics that may or may not be related to video games. While we sit and wonder which studios Microsoft and Sony will buy next, in fact, today's episode of Pactor Factor is all about that, Nintendo just keeps doing things its own way. It's working, so why change it? It was announced today that Nintendo has purchased a rather large piece of land in Japan to expand its game development capabilities. The new parcel, which was previously owned by the city of Kyoto, is right next to its existing headquarters and reportedly cost Nintendo over 40 million USD. And that's just for the land. Nintendo claims the purpose of the facility is to strengthen its research and development, and it's scheduled to be completed by 2027, just in time for the sequel to Switch. We're kidding. Or are we? Recently, Nintendo was asked if it were interested in purchasing development studios like its competitors have been, and it flatly said no. Instead, it announced it was investing almost a billion dollars into expanding its own in-house development. This honestly sounds like a much smarter plan than just buying up another studio where half the employees could leave the following week. Satoru Iwata explained this way back in 2008 when he said, quote, When we say we do not do mergers and acquisitions, there are always exceptions. We are not against M&A if Nintendo can absorb the real value of the company. However, in most cases, the value of software developing companies is attached to its people, not the company, which is merely a vessel for its people. So when we purchase a company, we can purchase the vessel, but we cannot necessarily purchase the contents. Even if we should compete with others to purchase a software company, although we might be able to increase the sheer number of our developers and to gain a short-term result, we do not think it will do good for us in the long run. We have been repeatedly saying that we will not do that kind of M&A. End quote. Microsoft learned this lesson the hard way with Rare, which ironically, Nintendo sold its shares to them. Now, Microsoft may have locked down some IP with the purchase, but it couldn't lock down the talent, exactly as Awada said. And many would argue that Rare has never been the same studio due to talent bleed. Purchasing a studio that doesn't even own any of the IP it works on makes even less sense from Nintendo's perspective. Awada also made this statement just after it was announced that Nintendo would buy Monolith Software. He explained it back then like this. Quote, Mr. Seguira, the president of Monolith, and Nintendo have a long-term relationship. How Mr. Seguira thinks is close to how Nintendo thinks. The software he would like to create is in line with what Nintendo would like to have for its platform. So... We thought that Nintendo should support this idea, and we decided to take action. End quote. Additionally, Nintendo was a major investor in Retro Studios back in 1998. The studio behind Metroid Prime had botched a couple other projects, and its leader was photographed in compromising situations that embarrassed Nintendo. But Nintendo was so deep into Retro, it decided to buy it outright for just $1 million. And this was... Four years after it was formed. A million dollars. That's it. Now Retro is considered one of its best first-party studios, though its output is certainly questionable. Nintendo was faced with the same decision with Next Level Games. That's the studio behind the Luigi's Mansion franchise. This time, it decided to pull the trigger instead of letting the studio go like it did with Rare. Nintendo's current president clearly shares Awada's ideals around this when he stated, quote, Our brand was built upon products crafted with dedication by our employees and having a large number of people who don't possess Nintendo DNA in our group would not be a plus to the company. End quote. Nintendo does not work with a lot of partners, and soon it may be faced with a crap or get off the toilet scenario with companies like Capcom, Bandai Namco, Sega, Mercury Steam, and Niantic. While it may not value these companies as acquisition targets, others do. And if it values these partners, it might need to pay up or lose them to a competitor. Now, Nintendo's way is just another way to skin a cat. And 
I would argue that the acquisitions that were made by Microsoft as far as Activision and Blizzard, you are actually buying the IP there. You're not just buying the talent. And some of the acquisitions from PlayStation are maybe a little more risky, particularly some of the studios like Haven Studios from Jade Raymond, which hasn't created anything yet, or some other studios that owns very little IP. Housemark, for example, didn't own much IP that was really worth owning. It really just invested in the talent at the studio, and that is where it gets dangerous. So if you were to ask me which of the three is doing the right thing, I would argue that Nintendo is playing it the safest and probably is protecting its aesthetic more than the other two. I would say Microsoft falls somewhere in the middle. Most of its studios that it's purchased do own the IP that they've been working on, which is a big deal. And then there's PlayStation on the other end, taking much bigger risks, acquiring developers that it has worked with in the past and it believes in, and it trusted with some of its biggest IP, but there's no guarantee that the talent, the people that make up those studios, will actually stay there and bear fruit. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield. You can follow me on Twitter at Dinfire. And while you're at it, follow Sifted at Sifted Games. And while you're on the interwebs, head to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a $4 a month pledge, please. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow. But until then, make sure you seize today because there will never be another.